In the second video, we're going to finish up our discussion of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins uh, to finish up section 3.2 for IB. First thing that we want to talk about today is condensation and hydrolysis. And condensation reaction is when two molecules are combining to form a single molecule. So if we've got two maybe monosaccharides, for example, two small particles, and we combine them to form a single particle, we get a single molecule and a small molecule. If that small molecule happens to be water, we call that a dehydration reaction. Um, and so in this example, maybe we're putting two monosaccharides together. Um, if we put those two together, we're going to make a disaccharide as well as a small water molecule. Hydrolysis reactions are just the opposite of that. That's taking a uh, single molecule and breaking it into smaller parts by using water. So again, if we were to take a disaccharide and input some water, uh, that's going to break apart that disaccharide into two monosaccharides. We can take a look at and, and see exactly what this looks like um, with some chemical formulas here. Uh, in this example, uh, we have an amino group and a carboxyl group, and we're putting two different amino acids together, and we're, we're bonding those by something called a peptide bond, a peptide linkage. And so we've got our two small molecules. We're taking out water. Uh, we're putting this together. This would be a condensation or dehydration because we're releasing water. And the opposite of that here, we've got a uh, disaccharide of sucrose. This sucrose is going to be split into glucose and fructose um, by the addition of water, and so this is a hydrolysis reaction. Uh, we can take a closer look at each of these more specifically for our different types of structures, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Within uh, proteins, amino acids, uh, two or more of them join together, specifically between the amine and the carboxyl group. And what this produces is a peptide bond um, that creates proteins, once we have a bunch of these amino acids put together, as well as a water molecule. Here's a nice image that demonstrates this for us. Here's our first amino acid, number one. Here's amino acid number two. And the portion that's highlighted red right here is going to be the portion that uh, becomes our water molecule. And when peptide bonds form, it's, it happens in a very specific location. Again, it happens between the amine or amino group on one amino acid and the carboxyl group right here on the second amino acid. And so here's our OH, the hydroxide, from our carboxyl group on one amino acid bonds with one of the hydrogens from the amine group. And so we get a peptide bond. This would be two amino acids put together and a water molecule. As more and more amino acids are put together in this format, uh, we eventually get a protein. And we'll talk about the shape and structure of proteins in a little bit. The same thing happens with um, the sugars and monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. In this example, two or more monosaccharides or disaccharides are joined to form a polysaccharide, and then a polysaccharide can be broken down into a monosaccharide or a disaccharide with the addition of water through hydrolysis. In this image, we've got two monomers or two monosaccharides being put together by dehydration synthesis, the opposite of that, um, breaking apart of two monosaccharides with water. Uh, excuse me, breaking apart of a disaccharide or a polysaccharide to get monosaccharides with the addition of water through hydrolysis. Very similar in fats, fatty acid, glycerol, and triglycerides. Uh, here we have a glycerol molecule right here that has hydroxides, uh, three hydroxides, and by attaching three fatty acids, we get a molecule that's called a triglyceride molecule. And so we've removed three water molecules in this case, and we have something that's called a triglyceride. Uh, here's our glycerol molecule, or formerly our glycerol molecule, and then our three fatty acid tails, which creates a triglyceride. You'll notice again that uh, we're removing water molecules, and we removed three in this situation, or in this case, because there's three fatty acid tails. So let's take a look at the structure of proteins. Um, there's four different structures of proteins or how they're arranged and it's dependent on a number of different factors specific to the actual uh, protein and what the amino acids make it up and the first structure the primary structure is, is simply based off of the sequence of the amino acids um, and this is determined by the genes that are in the DNA so in DNA there's sections of code that are specific uh, for a particular trait or particular function those are genes those genes determine the amino acid that's created and that sequence of amino acids that's put together, that is our primary structure. And so in this uh, example, this picture here, we've got just a bunch of different amino acids put together, and this is creating our primary structure of a protein. Our secondary structure gets a little bit more complicated in that there's presence of alpha helices and beta plated sheets. 
And these form from hydrogen bonds between the peptide groups of the main protein chain. And so what this looks like is, um, here's our alpha helice. We've got some hydrogen bonds forming between our different peptide bonds. So again, in this situation, we've got multiple amino acids put together uh, in both the alpha helices and the beta plated sheets. Uh, and how this structure form is by hydrogen bonds occurring between the different um, amino acids. So we've got multiple amino acids put together in this chain here, and they either form this, excuse me, this helis shape or this beta plated shape um, based off of the arrangement of those amino acids. And what's connecting these two or, or, or establishing this structure is based off of these hydrogen bonds here. Uh, the hydrogen bonds that are forming cause these two different structures. The third structure is called the tertiary structure, and this is the three-dimensional shape. So this is where the protein actually starts to fold and actually is, is formed into its particular shape, and this is caused by folding of the protein. And it's stabilized, again, by some hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic reactions, and ionic bonds. And so what we see in this situation, rather than it just being a, uh, a helice or a, a beta a plated sheet, we actually see this fold into the protein's actual sh uh, shape and structure. Our fourth structure or fourth shape is called the quaternary. And this is when two or more polypeptide chains form a single protein, um, multiple chains forming, excuse me, joining to form a protein. A good example of this is hemoglobin, which has four peptide chains. And let's take a look at what this looks like. We've got four different peptide chains here coming together to form our protein. And so we've got multiple of these folded um, uh, structures here coming together um, to form our final protein. And so this would be an example as hemoglobin. Here's our four different sections. Um, and this is quaternary structure. So quaternary is when we were actually combining multiple different polypeptide chains to make the protein. Again, here's a nice image that kind of walks through the whole process again. Uh, our primary structure is just the amino acids uh, combined together. Secondary structures are going to be either alpha helices or plated sheets. Um, and that's, again, based off of hydrogen bonds uh, between the different amino acids. Tertiary structure, the actual folding of that um, polypeptide. And then quaternary structure, multiple polypeptides coming together to form uh, the, the final protein. So our first type of protein that we're going to look at is called a fibrous protein. And these have a, an elongated shape. Uh, they're insoluble in water, and they're physically tough. Um, some examples of these are like what we would find uh, in connective tissue or in bone tissue. Um, these are very structured and rigid uh, forms of proteins, and so they provide structure and support as a result of that. The second type is called a globular protein, and these proteins have a more compact shape. You can see in our picture here the difference between the two. Fibrous is kind of like a rod or a wire or a filament, whereas the globular is actually kind of more of a, a rounded circular shape that's compacted together. Uh, these are soluble in water, have a rounded shape, and some examples of fibrous proteins are usually only found in the primary or secondary structure, uh, a protein structure that we talked about just a minute ago, whereas globular proteins can be found in all four different uh, structural arrangements. To finish up today, we're going to take a look at the difference between carbohydrates and lipids in terms of their energy storage. Uh, carbohydrates are obviously sugar. Uh, we've talked about carbohydrates a little bit. Um, one of the best ways that I remember this as, as a runner, um, when I go long distance running, uh, after a while my body uses up the available energy or sugar that I have, um, that I've consumed. And so myself and most other runners, usually long distance runners, will take uh, goo packets or uh, gel shots or, or some sort of um, uh, sugar that, that basically by consuming it, it provides the, uh, the body with a quick burst of sugar. And those are carbohydrates. And they are providing short-term energy storage. It's a, it's a form of energy storage that's used for short-term, so it provides a quick burst of that energy. Uh, they're soluble in water. They're easily transported around the organism. They can be rapidly digested. And they need less oxygen to release the energy. Those are some characteristics of carbohydrate energy. Lipids, on the other hand, are quite a bit different. Although they're also uh, storing energy, uh, lipids are more long-term energy storage. They're insoluble in water. They're difficult to transport around the organism. Um, there's more energy per gram in them than carbohydrates. So lipids actually have more energy in them. Um, and they need more oxygen to release the energy. You think about carbohydrates, um, 
you eat sugar or something that contains lots of carbohydrates, it provides quick energy. Lipids, uh, long-term fat storage. Um, and, and so it's providing energy long-term. You think about a, a polar bear or a bear uh, who's hibernating, um, bears who are hibernating for the winter, polar bears who are building fat reserves. They're eating lots of very fat um, fatty organisms to try to build up their fat reserves so that they're storing energy long-term for either the winter or when there's going to be less food available. Some similarities between the two, um, they're both obviously storing energy and they're both organic compounds. Uh, lastly, uh, we're going to talk about polar and nonpolar proteins. Um, amino acids have different R groups. We've talked about that. Um, hydrophilic R groups result in a polar amino acid and hydrophobic R groups result in a nonpolar amino acid. And so the arrangement of polar and nonpolar amino acids determines uh, both the function and the location of those amino acids in the organism. Uh, nonpolar amino acids are usually found in the center of water soluble proteins, and polar amino acids are found at the surface. Again, polar are hydrophilic, nonpolar are hydrophobic. And so we can look at the significance of, of what this means, and there's a couple of different uh, characteristics that we need to take a look at. Um, one, this can control the position of the proteins in the membrane. So determine of whether they're hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, nonpolar, polar, it determines where they're going to be found. So nonpolar hydrophobic amino acids will be embedded within the membrane so that they're not exposed to liquid. Polar uh, amino acids are hydrophilic, uh, are going to extend beyond the membrane because they are attracted to water and so they can actually extend beyond the plasma membrane. They can also help to create hydrophilic channels uh, through the membrane. So polar amino acids found within inside uh, the membrane create a channel for And they're specific to the, the certain active site in an enzyme. Uh, in our next video, we're going to talk more specifically about enzymes. But for right now, um, know that enzymes that are nonpolar are going to be specific to nonpolar substances or substrates. Polar enzymes are going to be specific to polar substrates. And so uh, this helps to distinguish between which type of uh, substrate these different enzymes can react with. That's it for this video. In the next video, we'll talk about enzymes and some more of their specific functions.